Okay, good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Everyone's enjoying their summer, no matter where you are. Good morning to those who are tuning in live. Good morning, Andy. Thank you for all that you do. Get the chat up. We've been having, we've been spending a lot of time in this world of understanding ourselves in a little bit of a deeper way. And the reason is because we run a risk of walking around in our lives and being successful at the wrong things. There's a risk like that, big time, where you win the wrong race, where you spend your life trying to get something that gets lost in your hands. I remember reading a story about a wealthy individual during the times of World War II, during times of the Holocaust. They had spent his life building this massive business. And as soon as he had accomplished everything he wanted to accomplish, his business, his home, whatever, then like the Germans came knocking. And he realized that it wasn't just that he was at risk. It was that his whole life's work was, was upended in a moment. So I, speak, I spoke about this once, about this happened another way. Um, I think it was during Madoff or just in one of the recessions, I had this conversation with someone very similar like this. And we spoke about these needs that we have. And what we're trying to do together is together. I'm not saying things because I've figured this out. We're just figuring this out together. We're trying to get underneath the different ways in which we live our lives and create a distinction between the people that live in, in, the, in the realm of giving arrows out and how they are driven in some more or less, depending on the levels of energy that you have. For those who come to the marriage class, we did this last week about masculine energy, feminine energy, the differences, because they're very much tied into significance or connectedness. But as we drive towards something, we got to make sure that we understand that with every energy, there's the good and the bad of it. In the energy of, in the, of significance, there's the good significance, which is being of value, being a giver, making the people's lives around you better, not keeping score. And there's the negative, which is taking arrogance, ego, you know, killing someone for a symbol, stealing, um, you know, I don't mean stealing just like stealing money from a bank, right? I mean, feeling like taking things from people because they'll make you feel better. And the same thing with connectedness, where there's the connection that's really giving, loving, appreciation, attention, affection, being that person who thinks of others, you know, that person that thinks of others, or attention grabbing, even subtly. Attention are also a little bit of arrogance, not less so. It's more of attention. We need people to look at us, not really appreciating who we are. And when you live in those two spaces, theoretically, you can be in a very interesting game because you can spend lots of your time wasting it. And if you, if you hit this level of being the giver, and you start to, and we start to take the pleasures of life in the giving of things, not in the taking of things. We start to become truly autonomous because the greatest subjectivity, the, not subjectivity, the greatest being subject to, right, the greatest thing we can give up in our lives is making the world around us the measure of our happiness. If we give happiness and give life satisfaction to those around us, we'll never be autonomous. True autonomy is not whether or not you run your own business. True autonomy is never, not, never is not whether or not you have your own car or you pay your own bills. True autonomy is whether or not you walk through this world and you don't need other people to make you feel good. That's real autonomy. I got a great question from one of our morning regulars. Now, and if you ever send me a question, please indicate if I can use your name. I never know. Great question. She asked, 
Let me just pull it up. She asked that sometimes being vulnerable can lead to judgment, negative criticism, and worse, a call for being ignored, which leads to more disconnect and aloneness, right? So how does that work? Sometimes if I'm being vulnerable, what I'm getting in return is being ignored. So let's sort of like break it up. Let's understand what we're trying to accomplish here. For many times, we're, okay, let's break this up. This is good, good question. I wanna separate now two different ideas. Idea one is called truth. Idea two is called peace. And I wanna delve in with you together on these two ideas. Because when you can separate truth and peace, you can navigate life much easier. This is based on a, um, a piece of, of, it's called the Medrash. It is a piece of Torah that explains that when God created the world, at first he created some worlds and destroyed them. And then he created a world and kept it. And they connect to the fact that God initially created the world through the prism of, of, of truth. And truth is too hard to bear. So he created a world now through a, a prism called peace. What is peace and what is truth? Truth is truth. You fight for raw, hard truth. When you search for truth, truth doesn't matter if it hurts your feelings. Truth doesn't matter if everybody gets along or not. Truth is either it is or it isn't. It doesn't take into account feelings. It doesn't take into account personalities. It doesn't take into account whether or not that's you or not that you're coming up with truth. Truth is truth. Two plus two equals four is four, whether you like it or you don't. Whether you raise your hand in class and say it's five, and if the teacher says it's four, you're going to feel embarrassed or not, it doesn't matter. It's truth. Truth. Then we have something in life called peace. Peace by definition means it's not truth almost, right? Because what peace is truth? If you're right, people should just follow you. But life mostly is gray. There's always a little bit of right. There's always some, and if it's not really right, because of the way our brains work in confirmation bias, we think it's right. So either way, you have two opinions to everything. Truth would say, if you have two opinions, truth would say, fight it out. To the victor belong the spoils, right? One of you is right, fight it out. Peace would say, wait, no, we're not gonna fight it out because along the way we're gonna kill each other. How many husbands and wives have taken that? They've just fought it out for their whole lives. And then at the end of the day, they don't even like each other. So he's, he, he's got 12 wins. She's got probably, you know, 200 wins, right? But at the end of the day, they're just too busy fighting. So yeah, they found truth, but they can't, they can't live. That's why in Hebrew, peace in the home is the, a good marriage is called shalom by peace in the home. It's about peace, it's about compromise. So if you see ever go to someone's home, you see a mezuzah in their door, it's always on the side. You know why it's on the side for? Because there's two opinions. One is it should go up and one is it should go sideways. And the rabbis usually fight for truth. But when it comes to a home, they say, it's got to be peace. So they actually compromise towards the side. Check it out. Next time you walk into a home with a mezuzah, you'll see it's on the side because they're giving you an indication. In this home, if you want the home to be work, don't fight for truth. Fight for peace. Peace means I have to give up a little truth. Peace means when I implement truth, I have to imp implement it in a different way. Peace, peace means I could be right, my kid could be wrong, but if I deliver the message this way, it's going to be a disaster. I got to pull back on the truth or I got to listen to somebody else. Where most people fail mentally is they are constantly, they think they're searching for truth, but they're really searching for peace. They think they're searching for truth in, in a conversation. They're not. They just don't want to feel bad. They don't want someone else to feel bad. And they, they, they murk it up. What would be great is if we said, okay, I want to search for truth as hard as it's going to be to digest. And once I find truth, then I'll pause. And before I bring my truth to the world, I'll go into the realm of peace. So for example, I want to know what I should be doing in this world. I want to know what the right move is. And once I know what the right move is here, I may not do it. It may be hard for me to do it. It may be weird for someone else to do it. I may not do it. I, I think it's, it's right for me to call my 
family member and say how I really feel about them. That's what I should do. That's called truth. That's the right move now. But if I call them, it's going to be so weird. I can't just call them. Now I got to change the administration of this idea. But now I'm in the world of peace. You see the difference? But when you think it'll never work, they'll never pick up the phone. You don't even get the truth. You don't even know what you want to be doing. Truth is trying to solve. The search for truth is trying to solve one of our greatest challenges, which is called cognitive bias. I've been talking about this in the show a lot here. Cognitive bias basically posits that what you see and how you make decisions is most likely flawed. There's a great psychologist, behavioral economist named Daniel Kahneman. You should read his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. If you want to read a biography about him, read The Undoing Project. Incredible guy, Israeli-born um, economist, psychologist. Him and his partner, Amos Tversky, blew the world up. They added behavior to behavioral economics. And one of his core principles is we're really bad at decision-making because we don't even, we're not even aware of all the biases that we have. We're not aware that we have what's called confirmation bias, which is we like being right. So if I teach you as a kid, this is right. If my parents give you a political party, a policy, an idea, a team, a, a way to approach your religion, many times you'll go through life and you'll look at the world and you'll just look for the things that confirm what you already know. You can be staring straight at something that's wrong and go, well, the truth is, because you're not looking for truth. You're looking to, conform, to confirm something that you already believed in. It's a bias. It's a big bias. Somebody likes smoking and he looks over and sees irrefutable evidence that if you smoke your life, you're increasing your chance of cancer. But then he sees that there's a guy who smoked till he's 100. He will say, yeah, but the guy smoked till he was 100. His wife may be like, are you crazy? He may be like, but they're both looking at the world and all they're doing is pulling facts. This is why you can have a, a world today where you have people on two political sides basically standing in the middle and killing each other because confirmation bias is so high. And the reason why it's so high for those who are studying with me, if, if you've been with me, you now, now we know neuroplasticity. The reason why it's so high is because back in the old days, we had a bunch of channels to watch. Remember CBS, NBC, Fox, ABC, WPIX and PBS. That's what I had growing up. In New York, it was two, four, five, seven, nine, eleven, thirteen. Game over. That's all you got. All you got. When cable became a thing, it was like, whoa. Growing up in my home, I had a little box, only two in the whole house. That's what you got. So the news was what you watched. So if you felt strongly to one way, Oh, Andy's saying outside New York, they, they had fewer. Really, Andy? Outside New York, you guys had fewer channels? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I couldn't have had you get less than the channels that I had. So when you watch the news growing up, like they reported what they reported. Let's assume that you were like a super conservative and you're watching the news and they're reporting it from a liberal perspective. You, you were forced to watch that. I mean, you could change it in the channels, but what's your job? See, today, the way the algorithm, algorithms work is that what you're interested in, they feed you. So when you go to news sites, the more you're interested in something, the more the algorithm picks up and goes, they're interested in this, they feed that stuff. One channel in Israel? Oh my gosh. Incredible. So if you're watching things that you care about, let's assume that you love the president. So you're watching things that are about the president. The, the news sites are picking it up and they're just sending you more things that are pro-president. If you hate the president, you're watching things that are against the president. So you wake up every morning and on your feeds are things that already agree with you. So your brain's like, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. You're just confirming every second, every day and the world is sending it to you. So you make the bias of thinking, well, if it comes on my screen, it must be true. And every time I look at my screen, it's telling me that I'm right, I must be right. So therefore, when I sit around the table and talk to someone who doesn't agree with me, I'm gonna kill them because they're for surely wrong. It's just confirmation bias. This country now is living in the world of confirmation bias. That's why you can't say anything to someone else that they don't agree with you because they think you're insane because they have no idea. We're not searching for truth. Some of us are. Some of the people in the country are. Remember, there's no black and whites, right? There's no like yes or no's. I'm sure plenty are searching for truth. 
but more and more we're just being fed confirmation bias and so we're polarization all the time understand that though that's it's a major flaw in our lives the only way you're ever going to find truth is if you are willing to go the other way the only way you'll ever find truth in your life is if you're willing to hear the other side because if you haven't heard the other side how do you know now you got to know when to hear the other side if you don't know enough about your side how do you get to the other side so you have to understand that you have to take a position and study it and think about it and then expose yourself with the truth, which is complicated in life, which is why most people, when they develop positions, they're very surface positions. Go to most people and you listen to them talk about politics, they know very little about politics. That's why in life, when you don't have a position in something, don't say you have a position in something, for the most part. We all do. When you have something you care about, study it. Understand it. Become an expert in it. Learn about it. And then look at both sides and you'll, get, you'll learn how to expand your mind. And see both sides of the story. When you're having an argument with somebody, stop. If you really want to do something great, if you really can do this with your, with your spouse, if you have that relationship and your spouse is up for it, play this for them. Maybe if they watch this, they'll, they'll be up for it. I don't know. Whenever, next time you're in an argument, pause and then take the other person's side. Amazing. You'll actually see something from someone else's perspective. And you realize how nuanced life is. When you're fighting with your partner, when you're fighting with your, um, with your colleague, when you're fighting with your friend, when you're fighting with anybody, if you really want to be able to get the truth, pause and flip sides. You'll, you'll, you'll have no choice. Your brain will be like, no, but I'm right, but I'm way, way, way. Now, what if you don't have that? So here's what you do. You write down your position. You write it down. Because when you write down your thinking, you've now brought it out of your mind onto a piece of paper. And then you come to it after the heat's done in your mind and you look at it and you try to pick holes in it. And you know that between you and you, you know you'll get there. And you just keep at it until you realize that you're searching for truth. What we're talking about right now is complicated stuff. I don't have it down. Someone emailed me and said, th they thanked for the show. You're welcome very much. All well, well from God's help. All from God, but they got to hear it a few times. I'm like, great. I'm sorry that I'm not just throwing out like, you know, maxims. Like I want to get through something here with, with, for myself, for all of us. What we're talking about is, is, is complicated. It's hard to get into the world of significance. It's hard to understand the difference between giving and taking. When you're working out to be healthy. Why are you being healthy for? You're being healthy because you're giving to the world, you, and unhealthy you is not going to make it, or because you're taking in their attention because you're competing with somebody else to look good in an outfit. It's hard. I don't know. It's probably both to some extent, right? If you're with somebody, a child, a spouse, and you keep on giving to them and they keep on stepping on you because they're unhealthy, is it giving or is it taking to consistently give to somebody that gets conditioned to taking? Is it giving to give your kids everything they want every second of their lives? Is that being a giver or being a taker? Are helicopter parents givers or takers? I could hear both sides pretty easily. How do you do it? So you don't give up. Because once you give up, it's over. Like once we say it's too hard, let me check an email, or it's too hard, I gotta make a living, or it's too, we're, we're out. The whole thing, this is the whole game of life. This is it, this is the work. Money, support, family, life, all of that falls under the category of my life. This is the work of my life. If, you, if we're not doing this, what else are we doing? Where else are we putting our brains? What else are we figuring out? There's no answer. It's the work. And all it takes is the commitment that we have to each other, that we want to be people that begin our lives in truth. Whether when we get to peace, we administer it, I don't know yet. We're not there yet. We'll work it out together with God's help. Right now, we're not up to truth. We're not up to peace. Either we're committed to finding truth in each other or we're not. And if we're not committed to finding truth, then how do we know that we're not going in the wrong direction? How do we know we don't wake up one morning and half the things that we spent our life on is just wasteful because I was doing it to get the attention that I never got. 
or I was doing to feel significant in a symbol that doesn't actually make me feel significant. How do I know? Oh, that's 920 already. It's amazing how quickly this goes. I hope for you. All right, we're going to pick this up. Don't go anywhere. With God's help. We're going to go. Because if you can get here, here's, how, here's where we're going. It's about writing and talking and delving. If you, if, you, if you do the work and you try to think and you say giving or taking, am I significant? If you start thinking and writing and questioning, what's happening is you're uncovering. You're, you're sensitizing yourself to your own thinking. You're distancing yourself from your own mind and you're allowing yourself to be the other person if you don't have another person. That's a great line. Let me just, well, before I go, I want to just read a couple of these comments. Wow, one channel. It's, thank you. It's training that's good to see the larger picture. Yeah, exactly. I'd rather be bored than busy. Great, Leon. It's a great, it's a great concept. That's exactly, let me just end with this, what Leon just said. Some people would rather be busy. I think this is what you, what you mean, Leon. Sometimes it's good to be busy because at least when we're busy, we're just, our brains are broke. But once you're bored, you got to be alone. Are right, we going to keep this up? Okay. Or we're going to talk tomorrow. We're going to keep this up. We got to get this. We got to understand because this is going to apply to how we deal with other people that don't respond positively to us. This is going to apply to how we deal with ourselves. This is going to apply for how we go above it. There's a lot of pieces here. Once you can get the truth before you worry about like, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do this? And once we can start living in truth a little bit, we can go from there. Okay. Thanks so much for tuning in. Have an incredible day. If you can, start writing down your ideas or do the worksheets like we spoke about in the workbook. And um, with God's help, I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.